Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and in this video, I get to share with you an interview I did with Naoki Yoshida on Final Fantasy 16. Now, in case you haven't watched my overall thoughts video, let me give you a bit of background. Last month, I had the opportunity to fly all the way to London to try out Final Fantasy 16. Thank you, Square, for giving me that opportunity. It was fantastic, and in that video, I detailed just some overall a bit rambly thoughts on the game with some more focused topic videos coming out alongside of that and over the next several weeks. That being said, while I was there, they gave me the opportunity to interview Yoshi P and just ask him a few questions. I had a hard time thinking of stuff. I was largely focused on the game and a lot of the stuff I wanted answers for we've either gotten through the previews like state of play or packs or we'll probably get soon or experience soon for ourselves. So I decided to pick his brain a little bit about some of the development processes and decisions they made about Final Fantasy 16. So here is what I had to ask and here is what his answers were. One thing, I'm gonna be using gameplay that they provided for us, basically like B-roll as background to this Q&A that I got to do, but all of that footage was part of a special build made for the media, so it doesn't necessarily represent what's going to be in the full game. And there will be a disclaimer at the bottom, pretty much the whole video. I would like to say though that Yoshi P wasn't the only person that was a part of that interview, translating for him and also answering a question for himself, Michael Christopher Koji Fox, who was so good to see again. He gave me a great big hug and he is very tall. So when I mean it was a big hug, I mean it literally. And also art director Hiroshi Minagawa, who I unfortunately didn't have too many questions for. I was just so much interested in Final Fantasy 16 and the aspects of its development itself, but he still chimed in for a question or two, so thank you to both of them for their time as well. All right, so the first question that I managed to pull together while I was in the middle of playing Final Fantasy 16 was I really wanted to know. So, so a big thing they've been saying a lot is you don't need to play the other Final Fantasy games to play this one. And I guess as a longtime fan, I wondered how much of that was just driven on instinct, how much of that was based on feedback. Why did the marketing team decide to make this such an important fact? And it was kind of the answer you expect, but Yoshi P, of course, always gives us much more detailed answers than just a this is why and then done. So so the reason this type of policy was born was back when Yoshi P was first tasked with Final Fantasy 16, when they did market research with fans, especially while they were traveling around for Final Fantasy 14, there were rumblings about the franchise becoming fossilized. Originally, it was kind of classic, but classic in not a good way, and it just felt trapped in this one particular space. And so that, of course, led to a lot of the decisions that they made with Final Fantasy 16 as a whole. They did say they got a lot of positive feedback. You know, Final Fantasy is legendary, great story, great graphics. But they also received feedback about how a lot of the stories were a bit too juvenile. Feels like it was aimed towards like a younger audience, feels very anime. The series as a whole just felt like it was a cult at times. And that was one of the more shocking things that he got to hear. Basically, they got out of a lot of that feedback that the franchise was a bit stagnant. They also noticed that a lot of their fans were in their 30s or older and that they weren't really attracting younger audiences with the franchise anymore. However, one of the biggest pieces of feedback was people who had never shown any interest or had never played a Final Fantasy game before. One of the biggest reasons they hadn't played is because there were so many. He's basically said this, when you watch anime, read a manga, or do whatever, you don't start from the 16th book. If you have a number on your game, people will think they are sequential. It's just natural. So not everyone understands that they're all separate. So the first thing they really wanted to do, the first wall they wanted to break with their marketing was that you don't need to play any other games to understand and enjoy this one. Perfectly reasonable answer. Uh, the funny thing to me was him hearing like a cult and that being a shocking one because those of us who are part of fandoms know that they can appear that way and a lot of us know how Final Fantasy can appear. So that one gave me a quick chuckle and I don't know if he noticed that but that was a funny little aspect. For my second question, I brought up the action gameplay. I mean, it is one of the most talked about things for Final Fantasy. One of the biggest debates amongst the community is action versus turn-based. So I went with their own marketing terms. They said it's Final Fantasy's first major venture into action gameplay. I'm just gonna ignore 15 because that's just what their marketing video said in State of Play. Without much of a history in the genre, what were the challenges with combining Final Fantasy with character-driven action gameplay? 
So we've heard a lot about why they've chosen to go with action gameplay, a lot of it being that not appealing to younger audiences thing or trying to feel a bit more modern or just trying to make the best game they possibly can and thinking that's the best route. But I wanted to know more about the background of it, the challenges, the development side things. So Yoshida said, on the development side, when they decided to go full action, they told the development team and everyone was pretty much on board immediately. They're like, yeah, we like action games. We play action games. Let's do it. They said they struggled a bit with one particular aspect, though. They had these icons. They were the main theme. And they wondered what to do about a job system. I mean, they're a staple to the series, so they wondered, do they incorporate jobs into the game? If so, how do they do it? Do they just scrap it? They said they spent close to probably two years just deciding whether or not to include jobs. They didn't think it would be right necessarily because just imagine Clive as a white mage, for example. They, they had finished one vertical slice of the gameplay, basically the Ifrit and Garuda battle that we've seen in some of the previews, and they just still didn't know. These types of questions, these types of things they were wondering were just getting to them. However, it just so happened that their lead UI designer was friends with Ryota Suzuki, who was thinking of leaving Capcom at the time. So he just wondered, oh, does Square Enix need someone who only knows how to make action games? And their director, Hiroshi Takai, said, yes, please, we really need that right now. <laughs> so it, Yoshifi said it almost felt like uh, some sort of faded path that they ended up actually getting him to come over to Square Enix at the time. And the minute that Suzuki-san joined, he wanted to see what they already had. So it's like, okay, what am I working with? What have you already developed? And immediately he had an answer to this whole job debacle. He's like, you have the icons, you don't need jobs. The icons are the jobs. All of your job type customization, the archetypes for your character can be done with icons and their abilities. So at that point, they finally moved on. They had a decision and they went from there. They said that if he hadn't joined, they might still be working on the battle system to this day, and it wouldn't even be coming out in June. So it's a good thing, good thing they had him. He really convinced them that even without jobs, thanks to all the icons, their abilities, and how Final Fantasy the icons are, that people aren't going to be necessarily missing jobs. You know, it just still feels very Final Fantasy. It's not every single aspect. And that's true. I agree with that. We have had games without job systems, but the character archetypes match things we expect from the jobs across the franchise, and that's always been a widely accepted thing. I do like to wonder what a job system would have looked like, but we kind of have an idea, I guess, with Strangers of Paradise, and this does not play anything like that. So, yeah, I, I kind of understand the dilemma that they ran into. The summons cover everything, and Yoshi P says everyone will probably be happy with that. So for my third question, I had to go this route. We have Clive, we have Joshua, Jill, we have all these important characters, but everyone is in love with Torkel. When and how did the team decide that this mascot and companion was going to be incorporated into the game? And yeah, Naoki Yoshida immediately had the answer for this. He said it was part of the very original plan of the game. When thinking about Clive and his journey, the people he meets, they come and go out of the party based on where you are in the story, they wanted something that was a constant. So they figured that with a companion, something like an animal, it was easier to keep them kind of alongside Clive the entire time. So they could have this individual, in this case Torgal, be with him throughout the story despite anything else that was going on. And it worked out fairly well, they feel. Another reason was that they simply knew they wanted a mascot for the game. And originally, Torgal was supposed to be a cat but everyone wasn't really sure that would work on the development team. I even inquired, I was like, what about a lion or a tiger? And I just, we had a quick laugh about it. And he said, yeah, they actually were going to go with something like a lion or a tiger, but they just felt like it would be harder to believe that a lion or a tiger was this like super loyal companion. So instead of feline, they went for canine, his own words. After deciding on a dog, the next thing was deciding on the design. And that was apparently a big struggle as well, because early on, they wanted to make Torgal's appearance fully customizable. You could make whatever type of dog, and so like if you owned a dog, you could make Torgal look like your own pet, your own ideal friend. Uh, however, their character designer and their graphics engineer were both like, you better not do that. <laughs> Even with only one design, 
Torgal was one of the biggest difficulties they had with optimizing, and it was because of his fur shader. It ended up being one of the last things that the team optimized because of that. But he is confident everyone is going to love Torgal as he is, and he asks that everyone please love Torgal. Now, at this point, I got him on the topic of Torgal to ask him one simple follow-up. What about the plush from PAX? Everyone has been asking when they can buy a Torgal plush after seeing it in PAX. And Yoshi P literally said that person who's over there in the back of the room, they are in charge of merchandise. So he just asked them, are we doing a Torgal plush? And she said, yes. Absolutely. So he turned back to me and said, yes, we are absolutely going to sell the Torgal plush. Tell everyone. The translator even leaned over to me and said, you just got a scoop. We haven't announced that yet. You'll be the first one to tell everyone. So please keep an eye out for the official Square Enix merchandise of a Torgal plush. Now, since we were already on the topic of Torgal, I asked about them deciding to add this companion animal in the game, but I wondered if the team always planned to incorporate him in battle, because it sounds like a lot of the focus was on the jobs and the icon discussion. So this question just kind of came to me as a combination of the last two questions I had asked. And Yoshi P said that that was also always in the original plan. Even before they had decided on the icons and the jobs, they knew they wanted Torgal to be a companion that actually fought alongside Clive. However, originally Torgal served a very different purpose in the combat. You know, now he's used just as a companion. He does a bit of damage. He can be used to extend combos to heal Clive. All of those things are there and those things were going to be there anyway. However, they didn't really know how they were going to do difficulty yet in the game. You know, back then they hadn't decided to do these timely accessories that we're going to have in the full release. So one of the ideas was to use Torgal as the difficulty modifier. So if you set Torgal to like the easy setting, then he would be hyper aggressive, he would do a ton of damage, and he would take a lot of relief off of the player, or a lot of the onus off of the player to play well, to play better. So he would just deal with enemies much more easily. The game would otherwise be identical, there's just Torgal would just do a ton more damage, and they, they decided not to go with that, instead they have the timely accessories now, uh, so that's not a thing, Torgal's just another gameplay system, and of course, our furry companion friend. Uh, the pet commands, like I said though, were always the same, sick, heal, and ravage. How those fit into the combos weren't really decided yet, but Ryota Suzuki, when he came on, he made sure that Torgal had these abilities and incorporated him into the battle as you see now. So unfortunately, I only had time for one more question. Uh, these weren't super long interviews, so I asked a personal one because I thought maybe we could get some insight into the various icons, maybe potentially one that we hadn't played yet. So I asked, do you have a favorite iconic ability? Specifically one ability, not just a whole icon. So this was where I got to get some input from Minagawa-san and Koji Fox. So Minagawa said that Titan's Raging Fist was for certain his favorite thing. He said he's actually not that good at action games, so when he messes up a combo, he gets really mad and he just wants to rage, and Titan is just kind of the perfect icon for that. The Raging Fist is actually a counter skill, so if you do a well-timed counter, you can then follow up with the Muda 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 Muda, and it's just... I think it's going to be a lot of people's favorite as well. And just so you know, it's Minigawa's favorite. For Koji, he said it's it's not technically defined as an ability. It's considered an iconic feat, but it's the Phoenix Shift. You know, that's basically just the one ability that you have as a constant, and every different icon has it and has their own version of it. So he just said, you know, I just love knocking enemies into the air and following them with it, especially Torgal, because Torgal can set up an enemy, put them into the air, and then you just follow with the Phoenix Shift, and then you could just do all these different combos, and you just look so cool while you're doing it. However, while those first two answers were short, uh, Yoshi P's answers are never short. <laughs> so Yoshi P actually said that he was going to say the Phoenix Shift as well. And it's actually because it was one of the most important gameplay decisions that they had made and something he was very, very adamant needed to be in the game. When they were originally making that vertical slice of gameplay I mentioned earlier, uh, they didn't have any sort of quick shift ability at all. And he felt like the tempo of the game just wasn't fast enough. So he asked his combat director and the other developers why there wasn't like a charge ability or a shift ability of some kind. And the response was actually a concern that it would be too close to Final Fantasy 15 with Noctis's warp strike. However, 
Yoshi P felt that people who played Final Fantasy XV got really used to it because it was such a, such a central part of the battle system. So if they don't have something like that, for people who want that kind of tempo and that's the kind of gameplay that they prefer, it kind of feels like a step back in design. Like, hey, we just did this in the numbered game before and we're not going to do that this time because it, it's, it's too similar? No, a lot of people like that kind of very forward, very aggressive design. So... He also had another concern. He wanted to make Clive feel more special. And technically, he is just a resident of Alistheia. But with his brother being the Phoenix, uh, Yoshi P felt like they could make him stand out a little bit more with these abilities, especially the Phoenix Shift. His brother could bless him so that even when he learns any new iconic abilities, you know, he at least has this shift in his back pocket. Story-wise, originally, because he's not a dominant, he was going to start the game with no abilities, literally just his sword play. But Yoshi P went, and then one of the big concerns was, you know, because he's not a dominant, he shouldn't have any of these iconic abilities. But Yoshi P went, just give him Phoenix powers. His brother's the Phoenix. He, he gets he gets the blessing and it works. Just there you go. It's fixed. The story's fixed. So, yeah, he was very, very adamant about the Phoenix shift. Um, he also decided to add in some answers about some of the other developers. Uh, the director, Hiroshi Takai, he wasn't there, but he knows that Hiroshi Takai's favorite is Shiva. He actually just stops using Shiva outright once he actually gets, or he stops using Phoenix outright once he gets Shiva. And the big thing for me, I ask, is it because of the lunge ability? It's one of the most basic things. It's just a gap closer that Clive can do. And Yoshi P's like, yep, he just uses lunge, and then he uses Shiva's own skills in order to navigate the battlefield. But, however, at that point, we were completely out of time, so we had to stop the interview there. I got a quick picture with them that I'll put on the screen, and that's my interview with Yoshi P. Got a few fun little tidbits, got that hot scoop. Keep an eye out for that Torgal plush. Hopefully, we'll be finding out about that sooner rather than later. But hopefully, you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share, and stay tuned. I'm going to be making a lot of Final Fantasy 16 related content and videos. I can promise you that. Anyway, I'll see you in the next one, and until then, take care.